this is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by, and I'm going to try and pronounce it this time. I didn't last time. I don't deserve it. I don't even deserve it. Timiner? Is that nope. at all close? Nope. Not at all? Okay, what is it? I mean, it has all the right letters involved. Please, uh, please correct me then. Andy Timoner. Timoner, okay. I yeah. had a feeling I was somewhere off there, but I, as long as school, I have at least the letters, I feel like that's a partial victory. They called my brother Tim Stoner. <laughs> uh, they would also, you know, you'll never forget it now. Yeah. Well, I also, I also have one of those last Tim names Boner. that like, they wouldn't even try and pronounce. So like, I can appreciate the, uh, the trouble with that. So I want to I'm always, I'm always introduced as Timoner. Okay. So it doesn't really. Good to know that I'm amongst the many, many people who screwed yes. it up before. <laughs> anyway, um, we're here to talk about Brand, A Second Coming, which was the opening night film of South by Southwest, which is a pretty awesome thing for a documentary to be there. Um, but the first thing I want to talk to you about is during the Q&A after the movie, you mentioned that you were like the fifth or sixth director to come onto this project. Yes. And I was curious about, was that something that concerned you as you headed into the project? Did that, was that something that you felt there was burden to use material or whatever people had done before? What was it like to sort of approach a project that, I don't know, had either failed or been passed on so many times prior to you taking it over? I was... Well, I definitely knew that the investors wanted me to use some of that footage. Uh, but that didn't, to me, what mattered was making a great film. And I wasn't going to make a great film unless I could shoot a new film. Because the, the thing is, there was a lot of great footage there. But there was no continuity. There was nothing tying it together. There was no story. So I knew I had to shoot a new movie to get a story and to really explore Russell's character and to really get in there. And then I could approach folding some of that footage in. So I asked him a lot of questions about that footage and that didn't work either. So I really had to figure out a way because I, there were gems in that footage, mm -hmm. you know, absolute gems. And I love things that are shot over time, as you know, may know, um, like know. a lot of my films are, you know, because I like suspense driven narratives. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to include and I like the depth that time provides. So I wanted to include that stuff, but there was no way to approach it where I, like I then I edited that together and then and then shot stuff to fill in the gaps. That was not going to happen. It had to be the other way around. <laughs> I had to shoot a whole new movie, then put some of that in. What is it like when you approach a project like this? I'm a huge fan of Dig. Uh, it's one of my favorite documentaries. But like, what is it like when you're dealing with these people on such a long going basis, like Russell in this case? that I'm sure at some level you have a personal relationship with eventually. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to sort of, as you, I think you mentioned at some point, protect Russell, but also sort of be honest in the story that you're telling? Because at the end of the day, you don't want to just be like a Russell Brand public relations piece. Like this is the Russell Brand that everyone you want to know. Or right. I mean, it's a delicate balance. You want to honor and respect your subject always. Um, and, uh, but sometimes that means uh, making them uncomfortable. I mean, sometimes that means that you have to do things that make them uncomfortable. Because it's just like when you look in the mirror, Spencer. Like, you look in the mirror yourself, you see a different Spencer than who I'm looking at right uh, now. Absolutely, yeah. And he entrusted me with the right to tell his story, how I saw it. And once I did that, I wanted him to be happy with that. But there's some things that I don't think he'll ever really be at peace with per se mm. because they're just personal and he's a private person, you know? Um, or there are certain people that push buttons in his emotional life. And um, so there were things that I needed to, to leave in the film that would weren't, you know, he wasn't really comfortable with, but he was also and is also courageous enough and self-aware enough to know that that's the best thing. Like yeah. he has told me that he understands that's the best thing. That the film that I would make would be better in that way. That it wouldn't be, he wouldn't be able to make a film about himself that plunges to those depths, you know, and, and, and includes all, the, all of the dimensions. And I don't know that anybody could. I mean, yeah. I don't know that I could. Yeah. I don't really... <laughs> you know, I think it's a very difficult thing, and I think we have case study after case study where subjects have been uncomfortable with films about them, and maybe it's only years later after they've realized, okay, this film was was really well received, and I'm loved for it, 
then maybe they're able to handle it. But even then, I doubt they want to watch it. Uh, you know? and, and I always wonder about that in terms of like, you know, um, reality TV, the consciousness of cameras always being around you. They say like, you forget that the cameras are there a lot of the times. And I, I personally, I find that hard to imagine me not like looking over and there being a camera right in front of me and being like, oh, that's not there. I'm going to not act differently because that's there. So it's like trying to get that authentic person to shine through when there's so much of that. Yeah, I was doing an interview uh, yesterday about the late, great Al Mazels. Um, uh, Michael Dunaway's directing a short about, about Al to honor him at the Sarasota oh, nice. Film Festival. Yeah, and I love the idea, and I'm going to produce beyond one of the producers on that film as well. And I was being interviewed, and... One of his questions was about how do I consider the camera to, like, what role does the camera play? Is it possible that the camera disappears? Is that even, even you know? possible, yeah. Yeah, because Al said the camera is very much like a, Al said it's like a therapist. The camera is like a, I forget the word he used, non-direct therapist. It's an interesting concept, yeah. Yeah, I think that what a camera does is it makes you, understand that you're living in the present tense makes you acutely aware of what's happening Mm. now and that is therapeutic because that is one thing that we are all trying to do is just well we whether we know it or not like what the advice is on how to live a happier life is to live in the present you know because that's actually the only plane that exists so but i don't think the camera ever disappears i think that what happens is the person holding the camera has a relationship with the person in front of the camera. Mm. And if that relationship is a good relationship filled with respect uh, and love and understanding and compassion, and the subject feels that from the person holding the camera, Mm. then the camera just becomes like a softer, you know, it doesn't have teeth anymore. Sure, sure. You know, it's maybe Um, the camera's smiling a little bit or winking, (laughs) you know. It's still a camera, though. But building on that sort of concept... um, how much consciousness did Russell have about the footage you were shooting, shooting as the time went on? Like, was he periodically looking at what you had made or anything like that? Because I just imagine some scenarios where, and I can imagine myself doing this very much, if I see something I do on camera, like if I see myself saying um a lot or something like that, where I try and slightly alter my behavior in response to something I've seen done versus just not showing him anything and then at the end trying to figure out. Right. I mean, you know, uh, Russell actually didn't ask me for anything for most all of it. Um, it was only when he came out with this book, Revolution, mm-hmm. and a lot of protests were starting to happen. And there was like this next stage of the story that we didn't anticipate. When we were already done with the film editing. Yeah. We were, I mean, we were pretty, not done, but we were pretty there with an edit when all this other stuff happened. And he isn't really a fan of shooting this documentary. He didn't really want to make this documentary mm-hmm. about him. Interesting. He didn't come to me to ask me to make a documentary about him. He wanted me to finish this other thing about happiness he was trying to uh, do. And I said, I could, but it would have to be about him. So uh, I think you know, that was the point when I said, and actually his manager, Nick Lennon, also really felt strongly that this was an important phase of the story to film. And thank God for Nick, you know, because Nick and, like, Nick and Russell are really, really close, and Russell really trusts him. And so Nick went to Russell about it, and Russell said, you know, I get it. I get that this would be something to film, but I need to see something. I need to see what Andy's up to. So I sent over about an hour worth of edits, you know, different scenes, different sure. parts of the film. And I got the green light. He said, well done. I love it. Loved it. Thought it was great. He actually wrote me that he loved it. That's fantastic. So that's why it was surprising, you know, a few months later when he saw the whole film. And I think that's why he didn't feel like he needed to even see the whole film, you know, at first. And he took so long to actually watch the film. I think that's why it was probably surprising to him and surprising to me, definitely surprising to me, uh, that he had trouble with the film. Because he had seen this hour's worth of stuff, a lot of which was actually in the film. Um, it, but when it all came together, I guess it was just difficult. And knowing that it was going to play in front of an audience. and It's just different reality, different state of mind. You know, who knows? 
I'm and not Russell. The, the world of documentaries is very interesting in terms of just like letting people inside your life. I uh, interviewed Adrian Brody for his documentary at the festival and I just asked him, I was like, as somebody who's like dogged all the time by paparazzi and whatnot, why on earth would you let essentially this very personal story be told to everyone so they can see like inside yeah. your home and stuff like that and I mean for him he talked about you know the artistic process and all that sort of stuff but it's just what did like, he say yeah what did he say uh I, I I mean I think he had all along planned it to be a, a, a very artistic documentary because like he was very philosophical about the artistic process of acting and all that sort of stuff um but yeah like Apparently his mom asked him like right before they were screening it here and he was like, I don't know, this might not have been a good idea. So <laughs> I mean it might be something that like I don't know, maybe Russell really just like didn't even think film. about like the reality of a documentary being released prior to it actually reaching that point where it's like all on some level a conceptual yeah, even, idea. Yeah, even when I told Russell on New Year's Day that we'd been invited to open South by Southwest, he said, Well done, Andy. Well done, Ons. <laughs> Yeah. You know, thumbs up. So, uh, you know, I think he was excited, but then he saw it, and he, it was tough for him. Tough it, for him. It's, I mean, it's a very personal story, and that's sort of one of the interesting things. It's, it's interesting to see you talk about that change to the um, – once his book came out. But what is it like – I mean, for something like Dig, it seemed like a very – sort of fixed time for the most part, like you were there with them for the most part. And this one is really covering a huge amount of his life. Yeah, I mean, this, from is his like, childhood. this is like baby on, baby yeah, pictures I mean, you on. You see all the different phases, you know, uh, somewhat broken childhood, drug phase, stand-up comedian phase, actor phase, and then all the way to there. So, I mean, it's a very sort of profound transformation that occurs in the process of this movie. And I don't, I mean... What was it like for you in terms of trying to condense, bring, that? condense that together? And I, I can't even imagine what it was like for him to try and sort of wrap his mind around seeing his life essentially told before his eyes. I mean, there were four editors on this film, you know, and I was on it the entire time. And I wasn't even in the budget or schedule to edit. But it became clear to me as of last April, a year ago, basically, yeah. that if I didn't edit, I don't know what was going to happen. Like, done. there was no way. There was director number six or seven, probably. Never I'm get director it. six, I think, but I thought I was five, and then a team popped up, so who knows? And I think I'm six. Um, I was thinking knew, about that. I, I wonder if I am six. I think I'm six. But you knew to actually finish this project. I knew that really we had to edit a lot. I mean, I edited day and night. I edited, my son actually had me calculate the hours, and I, I edited over 3,000 hours by now, personally. Wow. Yeah. That's wow. like... 12, 17 hour days, six days a week. That's amazing. You know? And we went and shot a bunch, a bunch in that time, you know, and shot a lot more footage in New York and London all throughout that time. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely a challenge to cut it down. I mean, there was a pretty good four hour cut, really pretty good. People loved the four hour cut. I'd be cut. curious to see that. You know, they four all hour thought it cut. was too long, but it had incredible stuff in it. Yeah, no, we should definitely. God, I wonder if we have an output of that four-hour cut. That'd That's a really good idea. Before we get off the ISIS, we should definitely <laughs> output the four-hour cut, even low res. Just have it. You I'd know? be totally fascinated for that, yeah. I'd be fascinated, actually, to see it. I feel like it's ancient history long at this Long-form documentaries are kind of blowing up, especially with the jinx and whatnot. I think, you know, I think so it's long enough. enough. How long is the jinx? No, oh, that's like seven hours or something You're like that. You're kidding me. It's incredibly long, yeah. You're kidding yeah, me. Yeah, it's, it's a whole, yeah. It's a whole thing. As plays as one No, 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 no. They broke it series. into like, yeah, I think they broke into like six parts. Gosh, or something like what that. a story. Yeah. Andrew, so. man, those Jarecki brothers, I tell you. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying like, here you go. You got your own one. Break it into like four yeah. parts or something like that. Who knows? I mean, Two I don't parts. know. I Right now, I mean, I just to answer your question about cutting it down, it was really important to show where Russell came from because all of that early stuff is vital for the second half of the film. You have to, to know... You know, it's like you can't have, you don't even know light unless you have darkness. Sure. You don't know happiness sense. unless you have sadness. There's no way to come through this transformation without point A to point B. So I, I had to go into the drug addiction, the sex addiction, and that was part of the story. To me, <laughs> that's part of what attracted me to telling yeah. a story is that consumer culture, you know, and advertising and marketing and film even, to some extent, like sells us on ideas of what will make us happy. These are ideals. You know, um, and most of it, the biggest one, the headline, the easiest 
one that's at every you know grocery store checkout line a celebrity front page of every magazine yeah. and you know Russell, I think, really has a very antithetical relationship to fame. He has a lot of trouble with it. He wrestles with it. What is it? What could it be? How can I use it for good? Um, what a farce. What a sham. What a distraction. And I think I had to tell all that. The fact that this is a kid who wanted to escape the penitentiary of anonymity. That's what he called it. You know, <laughs> the penitentiary of anonymity. I will get away from all my problems if I get famous. Yeah. And then he does. He skyrockets to fame. He's the toast to the town. He marries the biggest pop star in the world and comes up empty. And that, that's a story. But most people just then go recede into the hills with their millions of dollars, you know? For him, it's not enough, like he says to Simon Amstel. Not when the possibilities are so much more. You know, not when I could change the world, when I could actually do something with all this, you know? Yeah. And then it's revealed that his early writing partner, Matt Morgan, says, he always said, when I get rich, when I get famous, I'm going to change the world. You know, this is all he knew. It's a pretty fascinating Maybe he journey. knew all along. And you look at Gaddafi, and he's, like, already on the streets fighting the Corporation of London with the building thing, right, with yeah. Jack the Ripper. Yeah, 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 Fighting that building. Couldn't stop Spitterfield's market from being made, but he could stop the new era. Yeah. Because now he's got that 8 million Twitter following. It's probably 10 by now, by yeah. the time of this interview. He's adding more people all the time. And I just don't know of any Hollywood actor that leaves and moves to away. Like yeah. leaves, up and leaves, and doesn't even plan to leave, just never comes back. It's a Went off on tour, never came back. Profound, now he's overthrowing the yeah. government, you know? It's an amazing transformation for sure. Um, and thank God for the internet. Yeah. I mean, because without the internet, uh, this wouldn't be happening. The comparison with the Fox News and whatnot I thought was pretty <laughs> hilarious to watch. Um, so at least for the theatrical cut of brand a second coming what is what is the release strategy for that is there a place people can go to find out where it might be playing yeah, for them that's whatnot? all actually spencer that's unfolding right now Before i don't know our eyes, yeah yeah as soon as i get a break i'll okay. make a phone call i have no idea what's going on okay um, uh but i do know that you can you can follow it at brandthefilm.com or at brand the film it's pretty simple perfect. um and you can also pre-buy it there Wow. You can just buy your own copy Very for cool. whenever it is available to you. Very be cool. the first to get it. So, um, But, I mean, of course we hope to have a theatrical release. We think – I mean, it playing in theaters here at South By. It's very cool. It was – it was a great audience response. Come you know? up and to if Seth, you're in Ashland, like, Oregon, like, if you're in Ashland, Oregon, we're opening Ashland, Oregon, uh, the Ashland International Film Festival, um, April 9th, Thursday, April 9th. Oh, cool. Uh-huh. And if you're in Sarasota – Florida for the Sarasota Film Festival or in any part of Florida I'm watching this and you want to get in the car we are the centerpiece <laughs> film there the spotlight film there we're playing on the I believe the Thursday after Ashland whatever that is I'm not good at math 16th, 16th. yep um and in terms of you personally, do you have any other projects you want people to keep their eyes peeled for? Perhaps a four-hour cut of this? Uh, or uh, uh, is there a place people should follow you, Twitter, Facebook, something sure. like that? Sure. I'm at Andy Timoner on Twitter. Um, on, on Facebook, I have a fan page. And I do a show called BYOD, Bring Your Own Doc, that I really believe in and I'm very passionate about. And we film it every week. And it's with all of my colleagues in documentary. And very it's nice. me speaking with them. And so it's really just... That's cool, yeah. Yeah. And it's like a great resource if you want to make films. Um, so that is on the lip.tv. And it's it's Bring Your Own Doc or BYOD. If you just search BYOD Andy. You'll, You'll find, find it. it yeah. yeah, and then a totaldisruption.com. If you're thinking about doing anything in the arts or building a business or um, you just want to know what the latest and greatest thought leaders are up to today, that's our network for innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, it's a totaldisruption.com or at totaldisruption. And my next film is a scripted film. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Sure, Robert Maplethorpe. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for doing this. I wish you the best of luck with this. I would still like to see that four-hour cut, but uh, good luck. Well, with Spencer, it. you just got to give it a minute. Just give it a minute. I'm an impatient American. The two-hour one. <laughs> Look at Dig, but you like yeah, Dig, right? I love dig. Love okay, dig. so there's a five-hour cut of Dig, and there's a twelve-hour cut of Dig, and I get the <laughs> rights awesome. back in 2019, which hey is seeming closer and closer. Yeah, that's good. So stay close. tuned. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, and good luck with everything. Thank you. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to bite the sun. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.